Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present some of our research to you today. And in saying you are giving me the opportunity, I actually should highlight that I'm presenting here mainly the work of one of my PhD students, Lokman Hossein. So it is really the two of us presenting today. I would also like to acknowledge the financial support that Lockman has received for his PhD from the University of Western Australia, and also our collaboration with the CRC for honeybee products. And of course, I would also like to pay my respect to the Wajak Noongar people, the traditional custodians of the land where I record this presentation. Let me start by telling you a little bit about my background. I'm a registered pharmacist, but I also hold a PhD in chemistry. So I bring two very complementary fields to honey research, chemistry and pharmacy. Over the past years, we have, for example, developed a number of new analytical approaches that allow us to capture the often very complex chemical composition of honey. But I also look at honey from a pharmacist's perspective and another field of research that we are currently pursuing is trying to elevate honeys to the next level by applying not necessarily neat honey for clinical purposes, but incorporate honey into medicinal formulations, which might enhance its use. So when I think about honey with my pharmacy hat on, I'm often amazed to see that on the one hand, we are promoting honey as a potential medicinal product and I'm sure everyone here in this every therapy conference agrees that some honeys have fantastic medicinal properties. But on the other hand, we are not really treating honey like a proper medicinal product. Now, what do I mean with a proper medicinal product? We need to be sure about its efficacy, its safety, its stability, its bioavailability and so on. So there are actually quite a few hurdles to take before a product can be considered medicinal. Let me give you an example, aspirin tablets. We know that aspirin itself has analgesic and anti-inflammatory properties, but we also need to be sure that when we formulate aspirin into tablets, that they retain these properties so that they are still showing the same bioactivities and also that aspirin is released from the tablet matrix in an appropriate concentration and over a reasonable time frame when a patient takes the tablet. We should apply the same expectations and the same requirements to honey and honey-based formulations. But interestingly, there is literally no literature out there that demonstrates that the bioactivity of honey is retained when it is put in a formulation. And in the absence of such data, this is just an assumption. Similarly, there is also no published data that looks at the release profile of individual compounds from honey or honey-based formulations. So again, we simply assume that these compounds are released, but we don't know to what extent, over what time frame, and also we don't know if honey and honey-based formulations behave in the same way. We feel that having this type of scientific data would greatly strengthen medicinal claims made about honey and honey-based formulations. So the question of course arises, why don't we have this information already at hand? The answer is quite simple, with honey, we don't deal with a single active drug like aspirin in my example here, but with a very complex mixture of a multitude of bioactive compounds. They are often present in very low concentrations, but might still contribute to the overall effect. So to capture all of this adequately is really, really hard. But because Lockman is a very enthusiastic PhD student and no challenge is too big for him, as part of his PhD study, he set out to develop systems to generate this data and fill the gaps in the literature. And this is what I'm going to present to you today. There are two elements I would like to focus on today. On the one hand, measuring bioactivity, specifically antibacterial activity in honey, when it is in its neat form or in a formulation. And then I also would like to focus on how to capture the release profile of individual constituents from honey and also from honey-based formulations. Let's start with capturing antibacterial activity. You probably think, ah, well, that's an old hat. We can measure the antibacterial activity of honey and surely it should not be complicated to do the same with honey formulations. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. The antibacterial activity is normally measured in what is known as the microbroth dilution method, where you prepare aqueous honey solutions of decreasing concentrations and check which is the lowest concentration, so the greatest dilution, which still inhibits the growth of a particular bacterial strain. 
This is relatively straightforward. It's also possible to compare different honeys with each other. And theoretically, it would also be possible to apply this method to honey-based formulations. However, there is a catch. For the analysis, you need to dissolve the honey in water and prepare solutions. And this is not how we commonly apply honey in a clinical setting. Let's take a wound. We would normally apply neat honey or honey in form of a gel or a cream. So measuring the antibacterial activity of an aqueous solution does not reflect the clinical use. In fact, you have to destroy the integrity of the honey or the honey-based formulation for this analysis. And then we're making the assumption that it will have the same antibacterial effect as a honey solution. So this is not an ideal situation. So in this slide, Lockman, in collaboration with Dr. Kate Hemmer, his co-supervisor, who is also presenting today, optimized a different approach to measuring the antibacterial activity of honey, which allows to keep it as is. So there is no need to dissolve the honey or change the formulation. The products are tested in exactly the same way as they are applied in a clinical context. The assay they have developed is known as the overlay assay. In this assay, you have two layers, a denser base layer and a less dense top layer. In between is where you apply the sample you want to test. So this could be neat honey or a honey-based formulation that is simply placed in a small well made into the bottom layer before the top layer is poured on. The top layer is actually seeded with a bacterial strain, which will then start to grow, except for areas where antibacterial compounds from the sample have diffused into the top layer. This inhibition of growth, which is reflective of antibacterial activity, can be seen in a so-called zone of inhibition around the tested sample. The larger the zone of inhibition, the more antibacterial compounds have been released from the test sample. Lockman and Kate have been able to demonstrate that the method works for a very wide range of antibacterial formulations, and it certainly also works for honey and honey-based formulations, as you can see here on the bottom of the slide. On the left-hand side is the zone of inhibition against E. coli from neat manuka honey. And on the right-hand side, same experiment, the zone of inhibition against E. coli, this time from a manuka gel application. Now, this is great news as it allows to demonstrate that honey in its neat form and also honey in these formulations has antibacterial activity. Up to this point, this was really an assumption based on anti antibacterial activity measured in honey solutions. Lockman and Kate have just recently published a paper on this optimized overlay assay. It is an open access publication, so if you're interested in this type of work, I would strongly recommend that you have a read. It is a very interesting paper, and in my opinion, provides the honeybee industry with a novel testing tool that will help to strengthen claims made for honey and honey-based formulations. Now, on to the next gap in the literature, the release of compounds from honey and honey-based formulations. On the slide here, you see an example of a typical release profile of aspirin from five different types of aspirin tablets. You can see that with this data set, we can demonstrate that aspirin is indeed released from the tablet matrix and that after about 10 minutes, seen here, about half of the aspirin dose is released and it takes about 30 minutes for more or less the entire aspirin loading to be released from the tablet matrix and then it is available for absorption to the patient. So such a release profile is actually very useful for us as pharmacists, and release profiles like this can be obtained for all sorts of dosage forms, for tablets, for capsules, for patches, and so on. I want to focus on the way we normally test so-called semi-solid dosage forms. So this is creams, ointments, gels, as I think this is a very common way in which we apply honey. We place neat honey or a wound, uh, on a wound, for example, or we use honey incorporated into a cream or a gel. Normally, the release of drugs from semi-solid dosage forms is monitored using a setup known as Friends Cell. You can see a schematic representation here on the slide. You have a donor compartment here at the top where you apply the sample onto a membrane in between, which mimics the skin. And then you have a receiver compartment from which you can draw samples at various time points and then see to what extent the drug has moved out of the formulation through the membrane, aka the skin, and then into the receiver compartment. 
You can use this information to plot release curves similar to the one I shown you earlier for aspirin tablets. Now, when we want to use this setup for testing honey and honey-based formulations, we are faced with a couple of problems. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, honey contains not a single but a multitude of compounds that are released and need to be monitored. So we need to have an analytical method available that captures this. Secondly, you can only run a maximum of six samples in a traditional friend cell, as you can see from this scheme here. And in particular, when you're developing new formulations and you want to compare how they perform, you need to do lots and lots of analyses. So the testing capacity of a friend cell becomes a limiting factor. Lockman has therefore developed a new approach that allows us to overcome these challenges. First, let's look at how we can monitor the complex set of compounds that are released from honey. In my lab, we have developed a method known as high performance thin layer chromatography or HPTLC in short, which allows us to capture the complexity of the sample. As we're not so much interested in the large amounts of sugar and also water that is commonly present in honey, but in the about 3% of other compounds, we extract our samples with a suitable solvent to remove the sugars and amplify these other honey constituents. When we then analyze them by HPTLC, which is a chromatographic technique, the individual compounds of this extract are separated into individual bands, which we can make visible under different light conditions and also by treating the plate with different derivatization reagents. You can see um, these typical, what we call HBTLC fingerprints on the slide here. They allow us to capture the various compounds that are present in the honey extract. And as you can see from here, different honeys give different HBTLC fingerprints because on the left hand side on each image, we actually have the typical fingerprint of Manuka honey, whereas on the right hand side, we have the typical fingerprint that we get from a Jera honey. Interestingly, the intensity of each band is related to the concentration of the respective compound in the honey. So the higher the concentration, the higher the intensity of the band. We use this approach to monitor the release of compounds from honey and honey-based formulations. We can even capture multiple components at the same time with these fingerprints, and we can monitor how the intensity of the band changes and thus calculate how much of a respective compound is released at a particular point in time. In addition to having now an analytical system that allows us to capture honey constituents, Lockman has also developed a new testing setup that allows him to analyze release profiles of multiple honey samples at the same time. So he is no longer restricted to the maximum of six samples that can be analyzed by a traditional friend cell. I don't want to go into too much detail of the method or the setup that he's developed, but it is actually very similar to the friend cell itself in so far that it has two compartments, one in which he applies the honey, or the honey-based formulation, and the other compartment from which he collects the samples and then analyzes them via, via HPTOC. And then in between the two compartments is a membrane in the same way as we have it in the French cell. The sample containers sit in a temperature-controlled water bath at 37 degrees so that we simulate body temperature, and they're also lightly shaken all the time to allow for adequate mixing. So what results did we get from his release study using this setup? I reckon great results um, for the honeybee industry because we can demonstrate that honey, the honey matrix indeed releases compounds. This is evident when you look at the HPTLC fingerprint here on the left hand side. Over time, you can see how the intensity of individual bands increases, which illustrates that over time, more and more of the respective compounds have been released. We can then plot this information in a release curve, as you can see on the right hand side. Um, and in the particular example that I'm showing here is the specific release pattern for the compound that gives us this bright blue band in Jera honey. What we see here is a typical release profile, similar to what I've shown you previously for aspirin tablets. And even better, when we compare the release profile of neat honey, which is the blue line here in this graph, with that of a honey-based formulation, we analyzed in this particular case a honey gel, and this is represented in the orange line, you can see that 
the data for both the meat honey and the hydrogel formulation is almost identical, which means that we can expect to see the same bioactivity from applying the neat honey versus the formulation that we tested. Now, this was a brief snapshot of some of the work Lockman has done so far in his PhD, which I feel has implications far beyond his actual study. Just to let you know, he's also developed a generic formulation platform, which allows him to prepare different types of honey-based wound care applications. We call it a hydrogel and a wet sheet and a dry sheet, and each of them has very high honey loading, is incorporated into a biocompatible carrier. So they are certainly products of interest to the industry. Buckman is going to publish this as part of his PhD project very soon. So if you're interested in these type of products, watch this space. Well, I'd like to finish off my presentation with my pharmacy hat back on. Honey is a really fascinating natural product that has a lot of potential in various clinical applications in its neat form and also when incorporated into different formulations. But in my opinion, to really make the most of this potential, we need to think about honey more as a medicinal product and apply this lens to our research efforts as we have started to do as part of Lockman's PhD project. Thank you.